This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan Mysticism, A Study in Nature and Development of Spiritual Consciousness by Evelyn Underhill First Half of Part 1, Chapter 3, Mysticism and Psychology We come now to consider the mental apparatus which is at the disposal of the self, to ask what it can tell us of the method by which she may escape from the prison of the sense world, transcend its rhythm, and attain knowledge of, or conscious contact with, a suprasensible reality. We have seen the normal self shut within that prison, and making, by the help of science and of philosophy, a survey of the premises and furniture, testing the thickness of the walls, and speculating on the possibility of trustworthy news from without penetrating to her cell. Shut with her in that cell, two forces, the desire to know more and the desire to love more, are ceaselessly at work. Where the first of these cravings predominates, we call the result a philosophical or a scientific temperament. Where it is overpowered by the ardour of unsatisfied love, the self's reaction upon things becomes poetic, artistic, and characteristically, though not always explicitly, religious. We have seen further that a certain number of persons declare that they have escaped from the prison. Have they done so, it can only be in order to satisfy these two hungry desires, for these, and these only, make that a prison which might otherwise be a comfortable hotel. And since, in varying degrees, these desires are in all of us, active or latent, it is clearly worth while to discover, if we can, the weak point in the walls, and method of achieving this one possible way of escape. Before we try to define in psychological language the way in which the mystic slips the fetters of sense, sets out upon his journey towards home, it seems well to examine the machinery which is at the disposal of the normal, conscious self, the creature, or part of a creature, which we recognize as ourselves. The older psychologists were accustomed to say that the messages from the outer world awaken in that self three main forms of activity. 1. They arouse movements of attraction or repulsion, of desire or distaste, which vary in intensity from the semi-conscious cravings of the hungry infant to the passions of the lover, artist or fanatic. 2. They stimulate a sort of digestive process in which she combines and cogitates upon the material presented to her finally absorbing a certain number of the resulting concepts and making them part of herself or of her world. 3. The movements of desire or the action of reason, or both in varying combinations, awaken in her determination by which percepts and concepts issue in action, bodily, mental or spiritual. Hence, the main aspects of the self were classified as emotion, intellect and will, and the individual temperament was regarded as emotional, intellectual, or volitional according to whether feeling, thought, or will assumed the reins. Modern psychologists have moved away from this diagrammatic conception and incline more and more to dwell upon the unity of the psyche, that hypothetical self which none have ever seen, and on some aspect of its energetic desire, its libido or hormic drive, as the ruling factor of its life. These conceptions are useful to the student of mysticism, though they cannot be accepted uncritically or regarded as complete. Now the unsatisfied psyche in her emotional aspect wants, as we have said, to love more. Her curious intellect wants to know more. The awakened human creature suspects that both appetites are being kept on a low diet, that there really is more to love and more to know, somewhere in the mysterious world without, and further, that its powers of affection and understanding are worthy of some greater and more durable objective than that provided by the illusions of sense. Urged, therefore, by the cravings of feeling or of thought, 
consciousness is always trying to run out to the encounter of the absolute, and always being forced to return. The neat philosophical system, the diagrams of science, the sunset touch, are tried in turn. Art and life, the accidents of our humanity, may foster an emotional outlook, till the moment in which the neglected intellect arises and pronounces such an outlook to have no validity. Metaphysics and science seem to offer to the intellect an open window towards truth, till the heart looks out and declares this landscape to be a chill desert in which she can find no nourishment. These diverse aspects of things must be either fused or transcended if the whole self is to be satisfied, for the reality which she seeks has got to meet both claims and pay in full. When Dionysius the Areopagite divided those angels who stand nearest to God into the seraphs who are aflame with perfect love and the cherubs who are filled with perfect knowledge. He only gave expression to the two most intense aspirations of the human soul and described under an image the twofold condition of that beatific vision which is her goal. There is a sense in which it may be said that the desire of knowledge is a part of the desire of perfect love since one aspect of that all-inclusive passion is clearly a longing to know, in the deepest, fullest, closest sense, the thing adored. Love's characteristic activity, for love, all wings, is inherently active and cannot be lazy, as the mystics say, is a quest, an outgoing towards an object desired, which only when possessed will be fully known, and only when fully known can be perfectly adored. Intimate communion, no less than worship, is of its essence. Joyous fruition is its proper end. This is true of all love's crest, whether the beloved be human or divine, the bride, the grail, the mystic rose, the plenitude of God. But there is no sense in which it can be said that the desire of love is merely a part of the desire of perfect knowledge. For that strictly intellectual ambition includes no adoration, no self-spending, no reciprocity of feeling between knower and known. Mere knowledge taken alone is a matter of receiving, not of acting, of eyes, not wings, a dead alive business at the best. There is thus a sharp distinction to be drawn between these two great expressions of life, the energetic love, the passive knowledge. One is related to the eager, outgoing activity, the dynamic impulse to do somewhat, physical, mental or spiritual, which is inherent in all living things and which psychologists call conation. The other to the indwelling consciousness, the passive knowing somewhat, which they call cognition. Now conation is almost wholly the business of will, but of will stimulated by emotion. For willful action of every kind, however intellectual it may seem, is always the result of interest and interest involves feeling. We act because we feel we want to, feel we must. Whether the inspiring force be a mere preference or an overwhelming urge, our impulse to do is a synthesis of determination and desire. All man's achievements are the result of conation, never of mere thought. The intellect by itself moves nothing, said Aristotle, and modern psychology has but affirmed this law. Hence his quest of reality is never caused, though it may be greatly assisted, by the intellectual aspect of his consciousness. For the reasoning powers as such have little initiative. Their province is analytic, not exploratory. They stay at home, dissecting and arranging matter that comes to hand, and do not adventure beyond their own region in search of food. Thought does not penetrate far into an object in which the self feels no interest i.e., towards which she does not experience a cognitive movement of attraction, of desire. For interest is the only method known to us of arousing the will and securing the fixity of attention necessary to any intellectual process. None think for long about anything for which they do not care, that is to say, which does not touch some aspect of their emotional life. They may hate it, love it, fear it, want it but they must have some feeling about it. Feeling is the tentacle we stretch out to the world of things. 
Here the lesson of psychology is the same as that which Dante brought back from his pilgrimage, the supreme importance and harmonious movement of Il Desiro and Il Vele, si come rota che guelamente el nosa. These move together to fulfill the cosmic plan. In all human life, in so far as it is not merely a condition of passive awareness, the law which he found implicit in the universe is the law of the individual mind, not logic, not common sense, but l'amour che move il sole e le altre stelle, the motive force of the spirit of man. In the inventors, the philosophers and the artists, no less than in the heroes and in the saints. The vindication of the importance of feeling in our life, and in particular its primacy over reason in all that has to do with man's contact with the transcendental world, has been one of the great achievements of modern psychology. In the sphere of religion, it is now acknowledged that God, known of the heart, gives a better account of the character of our spiritual experience than God guessed at by the brain. That the loving intuition is more fruitful and more trustworthy than the dialectic proof. One by one, the commonplaces of mysticism are thus rediscovered by official science and given their proper place in the psychology of the spiritual life. Thus Luba, hardly a friendly witness, is found to agree with the fourth evangelist that life, more life, a larger, richer, more satisfying life, is in the last analysis the end of religion. And we have seen that life, as we know it, has the character of a purposive striving more directly dependent on will and feeling than on thought. Of this drive, this urge, thought indeed is but the servant, a skilled and often arrogant servant, with a constant tendency to usurpation. Some form of feeling, interest, desire, fear, appetite, must supply the motive power. Without this, the will would be dormant and the intellect lapse into a calculating machine. Further, the heart has its reasons which the mind knows not of. It is a matter of experience that in our moments of deep emotion, transitory though they be, we plunge deeper into the reality of things than we can hope to do in hours of the most brilliant argument. At the touch of passion, doors fly open which logic has battered on in vain. For passion rouses to activity not merely the mind, but the whole vitality of man. It is the lover, the poet, the mourner, the convert, who shares for a moment the mystic's privilege of lifting that veil of Isis, which science handles so helplessly, leaving only her dirty finger marks behind. The heart, eager and restless, goes out into the unknown and brings home, literally and actually, fresh food for thought. Hence those who feel to think are likely to possess a richer, more real, if less orderly, experience than those who think to feel. This psychological law, easily proved in regard to earthly matters, holds good also upon the supersensual plane. It was expressed once for all by the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, when he said of God, By love he may be gotten and holden, but by thought of understanding never. That exalted feeling, that secret blind love pressing, not the neat deductions of logic, the apologist proofs of the existence of the absolute, unseals the eyes to things unseen before. Therefore, says the same mystic, what time that thou purposest thee to this work, and feelest by grace that thou art called of God, lift then up thine heart unto God with a meek stirring of love and mean God that made thee and bought thee, and that graciously hath called thee to thy degree, and received none other thought of God. And yet not all these, but if thou list, for it sufficeth thee enough, a naked intent direct unto God, without any other cause than himself. Here we see emotion at its proper work, the movement of desire passing over at once into the act of concentration, the gathering up of all the powers of the self into a state of determined attention, which is the business of the will. This driving and drawing, says Rusburick, we feel in the heart and in the unity of all our bodily powers, and especially in the desirous powers. This act of perfect concentration, 
the passionate focusing of the self upon one point when it is applied with a naked intent to real and transcendental things constitutes in the technical language of mysticism the state of recollection a condition which is peculiarly characteristic of the mystical consciousness and is the necessary prelude of pure contemplation that state in which the mystic enters into communion with reality we have then arrived so far in our description of the mechanism of the mystic possessed like other men of powers of feeling thought and will it is essential that his love and his determination even more than his thought should be set upon transcendent reality he must feel a strong emotional attraction toward the supersensual object of his quest that love which scholastic philosophy defined as the force or power which causes every creature to follow out the trend of its own nature of this must be born the will to attain communion with that absolute object this will this burning and active desire must crystallize into and express itself by that definite and conscious concentration of the whole self upon the object which precedes the contemplative state we see already how far astray are those who look upon the mystical temperament as passive in type our next concern then would seem to be with this condition of contemplation what it does and whither it leads what is a its psychological explanation and b its empirical value now in dealing with this and other rare mental conditions we are of course trying to describe from without that which can only adequately be described from within which is as much as to say that only mystics can really write about mysticism fortunately many mystics have so written and we from their experiences and from the explorations of psychology upon another plane are able to make certain elementary deductions it appears generally from these that the act of contemplation is for the mystic a psychic gateway a method of growing from one level of consciousness to another in technical language it is the condition under which he shifts his field of perception and obtains his characteristic outlook on the universe that there is such a characteristic outlook peculiar to no creed or race is proved by the history of mysticism which demonstrates plainly enough that in some men another sort of consciousness another sense may be liberated beyond the normal powers we have discussed this sense has attachments at each point to emotion to intellect and to will it can express itself under each of the aspects which these terms connote yet it differs from and transcends the emotional intellectual and volitional life of ordinary men it was recognized by plato as that consciousness which could apprehend the real world of the ideas its development is the final object of that education which his republic describes it is called by potinus another intellect different from that which reasons and is denominated rational its business he says is the perception of the supersensual or in neoplatonic language the intelligible world it is the sense which in the words of the theologica germanica has the power of seeing into eternity the mysterious eye of the soul by which saint augustine saw the light that never changes it is says al-ghazali a persian mystic of the 11th century like an immediate perception as if one touched its object with one's hand in the words of his great christian successor saint bernard it may be defined as the soul's true unerring intuition the unhesitating apprehension of truth which simple vision of truth says saint thomas aquinas ends in a movement of desire it is infused with burning love for it seems to its possessors to be primarily a movement of the heart with intellectual subtlety for its ardor is wholly spent upon the most sublime object of thought with unflinching will for its adventures are undertaken in the teeth of the natural doubts prejudices languors and self-indulgence of man these adventures looked upon by those who stay at home as a form of the higher laziness are in reality the last and most arduous labors which the human spirit is called to perform they are the only known method by which we can come into conscious possession of all our powers 
and, rising from the lower to the higher levels of consciousness, become aware of that larger life in which we are immersed, attain communion with the transcendent personality in whom that life is resumed. Mary has chosen the better, not the idler part, for her gaze is directed towards those first principles without which the activity of Martha would have no meaning at all. In vain does sardonic common sense, confronted with a contemplative type, reiterate the sneer of Mucius, Encore senti l'heureux que la pauvre Marthe leur fasse la cuisine. It remains a paradox of the mystics that the passivity at which they appear to aim is really a state of the most intense activity. More, that where it is wholly absent, no great creative action can take place. In it, the superficial self compels itself to be still, in order that it may liberate another, more deep-seated power, which is, in the ecstasy of the contemplative genius, raised to the highest pitch of efficiency. This restful travail, said Walter Hilton, is full far from fleshly idleness and from blind security. It is full of ghostly work, but it is called rest, for grace looseth the heavy yoke of fleshly love from the soul, and maketh it mighty and free through the gift of the holy ghostly love for to work gladly, softly, and delectably. Therefore is it called an holy idleness, and a rest most busy, and so is it in stillness from the great crying and the beastly noise of fleshly desires. If those who have cultivated this latent power be correct in their statements, the self was mistaken in supposing herself to be entirely shut off from the true external universe. She has, it seems, certain tentacles which, once she learns to uncurl them, will stretch sensitive fingers far beyond that limiting envelope in which her normal consciousness is contained, and give her news of a higher reality than that which can be deduced from the reports of the senses. The fully developed and completely conscious human soul can open as an anemone does, and know the ocean in which she is bathed. This act, this condition of consciousness, in which barriers are obliterated, the absolute flows in on us, and we, rushing out to its embrace, find and feel the infinite above all reason and above all knowledge, is the true mystical state. The value of contemplation is that it tends to produce this state release this transcendental sense, and so turns the lower servitude in which the natural man lives under the sway of his earthly environment to the higher servitude of fully conscious dependence on that reality in whom we live and move and have our being. What then, we ask, is the nature of this special sense, this transcendental consciousness, and how does contemplation liberate it? Any attempt to answer this question brings upon the scene another aspect of man's psychic life, an aspect of paramount importance to the student of the mystic type. We have reviewed the chief ways in which our surface consciousness reacts upon experience, a surface consciousness which has been trained through long ages to deal with the universe of sense. We know, however, that the personality of man is a far deeper and more mysterious thing than the sum of his conscious feeling, thought and will. That this superficial self, this ego of which each of us is aware, hardly counts in comparison with the deeps of being which it hides. There is a root or depth in thee, says Law, from whence all these faculties come forth as lines from a centre, or as branches from the body of a tree. This depth is called the centre, the fund or bottom of the soul. This depth is the unity, the eternity, I had almost said the infinity of thy soul, for it is so infinite that nothing can satisfy it or give it any rest but the infinity of God. Since normal man is utterly unable to set up relations with spiritual reality by means of his feeling, thought and will, it is clearly in this depth of being, in these unplumbed levels of personality, that we must search if we would find the organ, the power by which he is to achieve the mystic quest. 
That alteration of consciousness which takes place in contemplation can only mean the emergence from this fund or bottom of the soul of some faculty which diurnal life keeps hidden in the deeps. Modern psychology, in its doctrine of the unconscious or subliminal personality, has acknowledged this fact of a range of psychic life lying below and beyond the conscious field. Indeed, it has so dwelt upon and defined this shadowy region, which is really less a region than a useful name, that it sometimes seems to know more about the unconscious than about the conscious life of man. There it finds, side by side, the sources of his most animal instincts, his least explicable powers, his most spiritual intuitions, the ape and tiger, and the soul. Genius and prophecy, insomnia and infatuation, clairvoyance, hypnotism, hysteria, and Christian science are all explained by the unconscious mind. In his destructive moods, the psychologist has little apparent difficulty in reducing the chief phenomena of religions and mystical experience to activities of the unconscious, seeking an oblique satisfaction of repressed desires. Where he undertakes the more dangerous duties of apologetic, he explains the same phenomena by saying that God speaks to man in the subconscious, by which he can only mean that our apprehensions of the eternal have the character of intuition rather than of thought. Yet the unconscious, after all, is merely a convenient name for the aggregate of those powers, parts or qualities of the whole self which at any given moment are not conscious, or that the ego is not conscious of. Included in the unconscious region of an average healthy man are all those automatic activities by which the life of the body is carried on, all those uncivilized instincts and vices, those remains of the ancestral savage, which education has forced out of the stream of consciousness, and which now only send their messages to the surface in a carefully disguised form. There too work in the hiddenness those longings for which the busy life of the world leaves no place. And there lies that deep pool, that heart of personality, from which in moments of lucidity a message may reach the conscious field. Hence in normal men the best and worst, most savage and most spiritual parts of character are bottled up below the threshold. Often the partisans of the unconscious forget to mention this. It follows, then, that whilst we may find it convenient and indeed necessary to avail ourselves of the symbols and diagrams of psychology in tracking out the mystic way, we must not forget the large and vague significance which attaches to these symbols and the hypothetical character of many of the entities they represent. Nor must we allow ourselves to use the unconscious as the equivalent of man's transcendental sense. Here the mystics have surely displayed a more scientific spirit, a more delicate power of analysis than the psychologists. They, too, were aware that in normal men the spiritual sense lies below the threshold of consciousness. Though they had not at their command the spatial metaphors of the modern school and could not describe man's ascent toward God in those picturesque terms of levels and uprushes, margins and fields, projection, repression and sublimation, which now comes so naturally to investigators of the spiritual life. They leave us in no doubt as to their view of the facts. Further, man's spiritual history primarily meant for them, as it means for us, the emergence of this transcendental sense, its capture of the field of consciousness, and the opening up of those paths which permit the inflow of a larger spiritual life, the perception of a higher reality. This, insofar as it was an isolated act, was contemplation. When it was part of the general life process and had permanent results, they called it the new birth which maketh alive. The faculty or personality concerned in the new birth, the spiritual man, capable of the spiritual vision and life, which was dissociated from the earthly man adapted only to the natural life, was always sharply distinguished by them from the total personality, conscious or unconscious. It was something definite, a bit or spot of man which, belonging not to time but to eternity, was different in kind from the rest of his human nature, 
framed in all respects to meet the demands of the merely natural world. The business of the mystic in the eyes of these old specialists was to remake, transmute his total personality in the interest of his spiritual self, to bring it out of the hiddenness and unify himself about it as a centre, thus putting on divine humanity. The divine nucleus, the point of contact between man's life and the divine life in which it is immersed and sustained, has been given many names in course of the development of mystical doctrine. All clearly mean the same thing, though emphasizing different aspects of its life. Sometimes it is called the synteresis, the keeper or preserver of his being. Sometimes the spark of the soul, the funklein of the German mystics. Sometimes its apex, the point at which it touches the heavens. Then, with a sudden flight to the other end of the symbolic scale, and in order to emphasize its participation in pure being, rather than its difference from mere nature, it is called the ground of the soul, the foundation or basal stuff indwelt by God, whence springs all spiritual life. Clearly all these guesses and suggestions aim at one goal, and are all to be understood in a symbolic sense. For, as Malleville observed in answer to his disciples' anxious inquiries on this subject, since the soul of man is a spiritual thing, and thus cannot have divisions or parts, consequently it cannot have height or depth, summit or surface. But because we judge spiritual things by the help of material things, since we know these better and they are more familiar to us, we call the highest of all forms of conception the summit, and the easier way of comprehending things, the surface of the understanding. Here, at any rate, whatever name we may choose to give it, is the organ of man's spiritual consciousness, the place where he meets the absolute, the germ of his real life. Here is the seat of that deep transcendental feeling, the beginning and end of metaphysics, which is, says Professor Stewart, at once the solemn sense of timeless being, of that which was, and is, and ever shall be, overshadowing us, and the conviction that life is good. I hold, says the same writer, that it is in transcendental feeling, manifested normally as faith in the value of life, and ecstatically as sense of timeless being, and not in thought proceeding by way of speculative construction, that consciousness comes nearest to the object of metaphysics, ultimate reality. The existence of such a sense, such an integral part or function of the complete human being, has been affirmed and dwelt upon not only by the mystics, but by seers and teachers of all times and creeds, by Egypt, Greece and India, the poets, the fakirs, the philosophers and the saints. A belief in its actuality is the pivot of the Christian position, indeed of every religion worthy of the name. It is the justification of mysticism, ascetism, the whole machinery of the self-renouncing life. That there is an extreme point at which man's nature touches the absolute, that his ground or substance, his true being, is penetrated by the divine life which constitutes the underlying reality of things. This is the basis on which the whole mystic claim of possible union with God must rest. Here, they say, is our link with reality, and in this place alone can be celebrated the marriage from which the Lord comes. To use another of their diagrams, it is thanks to the existence within him of this immortal spark from the central fire that man is implicitly a child of the infinite. The mystic way must therefore be a life, a discipline, which will so alter the constituents of his mental life as to include this spark within the conscious field, bring it out of the hiddenness from those deep levels where it sustains and guides his normal existence, and make it the dominant element round which his personality is arranged. End of the first half of part one, chapter three.